fundamental holy principles uh, that are found in the word that brings sense life and promise life. And yet the reality is that for many people, they continue to struggle in the realm of family. It's true. And this is what I've learned from many years of pastoring. I've learned that one series of messages, even though it's a long series, it's not going to solve every issue and every problem immediately. But I want to tell you, I wanted to bring something to you to kind of put a book in on this series that will bring hope to you and faith to you. Because I do know something that can change powerfully families, okay? And I want to talk to you about the power of praying for your family. Prayer really does change things. And this morning, what we're going to do, we're going to look at, at a message out of Matthew. So you can turn with me to Matthew chapter 15, where a Canaanite woman brought her demon-possessed child to Jesus and pleaded with him to please set my daughter free. And while I'm going to be preaching in the context, all right, about a mother uh, entreating Christ for a daughter, uh, let me tell you, the principles work and praying for any part of your family okay you can this, this works for praying for your mom for your if you're a grandparent praying for your kids or your cousins whoever's a part of your family or even outside of your family these are this these principles are that i'm going to share are, are going to help you today and i'll tell you it's nice to be able to pray that our family is blessed right I mean, those are many of the prayers that I believe that God hears, you know. We pray for good jobs and good marriages and nice cars and raises and pregnancies. And, and we pray for health and we pray for happiness and love and peace and joy and all of those things. And I'll tell you, those are all fine, wonderful petitions. I believe God hears every prayer that we pray. Come on. But I want to tell you that the most important prayer that you can ever pray for anyone, especially your family and especially your children, is that they would come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. How many of you believe that? That they walk with God, that they know Him in a powerful and an intimate way, and that they serve Him all the days of their life. And when I say that, I'm not just uh, praying, we're not going to be praying that, 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 you know, they say a little prayer prayer, shake a preacher's hand, and go on with life as usual. No, I want every young person in this church. I want all of your family, my family, my extended family, everybody that we know to have a real relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on. One that is founded on, the, on, on, on faith and a relationship that cause people to turn away from their sin and make Jesus the Lord of their life. Come on. And so I've discovered that there's a lot of people in our world today that acknowledge Christianity in their mind. But Christ is not on the throne of their heart. The truth is there are a lot of people who think that they are okay with God, but in reality they aren't. The Jesus himself said this, I'm just going to read this one scripture, then we're going to get to Matthew 15. Jesus said, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles then i will tell them plainly i never knew you away from me you evil doers this is all i know my friends is that there is a wide gate and a broad path that leads to destruction, right? right? And then there's a narrow gate and a straight path that leads to life. And our family is either on one road or another. There's no neutrality. And while it's a wonderful thing to pray for stuff, and I've asked God for stuff. I've done that. I've prayed and God has answered many, many of those prayers. Let me tell you, if you're going to fight for your family, the main fight ought to be that they come to know Jesus Christ in a real and personal way. Come on, if you believe that, give the Lord a big hand of praise today. Come on. Matthew chapter 15. This generation has to learn how to fight in prayer like other generations did. Is there anybody in the house who had a praying mama, a praying grandmother, a praying aunt, a praying somebody, right? Thank God for those wonderful uh, uh, family members who prayed over us. Matthew 15 and verse 21. Uh, this is what the word says. It says, Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyr and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came. Notice 
Jews he came from, from that region, and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came, notice what she did, and worshiped him, Amen. saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Right. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Now let me just say this, that this scripture is a powerful and tremendous example for you and for me. Because this was a woman who entreated Jesus for her daughter. And we have to ask the question, well, why was this young lady demon-possessed? What happened to her? Well, I'll tell you, the religion of Canaan in that day was very evil. It was filled with sexuality and with occultism. And those two kind of always go together. And the Bible talks about the sins of the fathers being visited upon the next generation. And so what we discover is that demonic activity often moves in family lines. And so apparently... Apparently this, this child received this as, as a result of this false type of religion that was going on there. I can't believe that this child did something to deserve this or somehow let these demonic forces in. But here it is. This woman comes and she's a Canaanite and Jesus is now visiting what's now Lebanon, okay? Which way up in the north is called Tyr and Sidon and, she, and Jesus is in the area and she has already heard of him. The fame of Christ is spread across the land, right? And Jesus has heard of, of, of who he is. And, excuse me, excuse me. She's heard of who Jesus is and, and, and so she comes to visit Jesus. And the good news is that Jesus had come into the area to make it easier for her to find the grace that she needed. But I want to say this this morning, that before she could find deliverance for her daughter, she had some things that she needed to overcome. And we also, before we can uh, find deliverance for our family, before we can find uh, the victory that we need in order to pray powerfully, you're going to have to overcome some barriers. Amen? So let me just hit some barriers today that this woman had to overcome, okay? I'm going to hit the first four really quickly today. Uh, the first one was the barrier of her religion. You know, she could have said, hey, you know, we have our own religion. I'm a Canaanite. Why would I go to this, uh, this Jewish man, you know? Uh, I don't need that kind of religion. And, you know, there's a lot of people that hide behind their religion. And I say, listen, don't let religion stop you from coming to Jesus. Amen? He's the way, the truth, and the life. And then there was the barrier, barrier of her culture. The Canaanites were despised by many of the Jewish people. I'm not saying that was a good thing. I'm just saying it was so, all right? They were outcasts. And she could have said, I'd rather just see my child suffer demonic possession than have to go to a, a Jew to try to find help. Help. It would kind of be like in today's world, a Palestinian in, in the Gaza Strip reaching out to a Jewish person for help. You know, I mean, it just probably wasn't done with those with those kind of uh, deep cultural roots. And then there was the barrier of her divided family. Now we don't really know what happened to her husband, but at least her husband wasn't there with them, with her. So maybe they were divided on the issue of whether they should bring her child to Jesus. Or maybe she was a single parent. Uh, what, what, whatever it was, she had to overcome that. And then she had to overcome the barrier of being a woman, hold on for a minute, in a male-dominated society. That's right. I mean, then society then was dominated by the male gender, right? And yet we find this young single lady with her daughter, we find her coming up, not just talking to one, but Jesus was there with his disciples, right? It was Jesus, his 12 disciples. She had to actually go and talk to all of them. Them, but she was determined, right? She was determined that her child needed had to be set free. And she, had, she, she, she needed a word from Jesus. And so she was willing to overcome all of that. 
How many of you are still tracking with me today? Because now we're going to get to a point, uh, a barrier that many people have to face in their life as they pray for their family. And that is the barrier of his, I'm going to add one word to my outline today, his seeming silence. She comes in and it's amazing that she knows who Jesus is. In fact, she's got some tremendous theology, right? She says, listen, she says, uh, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon possessed. But I want you to notice the rest of that verse. It says, he answered her not a word. I want to ask you something. Would that have bothered you? I know that there's a lot of people who pray for their children or their family and they cry out to God. They cry out to God, but it just seems as though the heavens don't answer. It seems like God doesn't care. It seems like all is silence. Those of you who are praying for your family, are you put off by the silence of God? Are you put off by the seemingly indifference of God when your child or your loved one, your husband or your wife, they're needing help. They need a word from the Almighty, and it just seems like it doesn't come. But I want to tell you something about this woman of great faith, all right? If you're taking notes, you need to write this down. This is a powerful statement because this woman knew that the silence of God was never a sign of the indifference of God. Amen. Come on. Even here where Jesus is silent, he is secretly plotting mercy for this child. And I believe that the entire reason that we find Jesus so far away from the lost sheep of the house of Israel, he's all the way in Tyre and Sidon. It was because he knew that there was a woman who was struggling. He knew that there was a young girl who needed deliverance. And some people have seen this passage. They think, well, wow, wasn't Jesus kind of rude? here. Uh, but, but I don't think so. His very presence, the very fact that he was in that part of the world tells us that he had a heart, amen, for this young woman. He had a heart for her daughter. Come on, give the Lord a hand of praise today if you believe Jesus loves the entire world. Amen. 